tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes steal the joy I own when brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love this power that can break off every chain this power that can empty out a grave this resurrection power that can save is power in your name power in your name my fear doesn't stand a chance when i stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when i stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when i stand in your love This week, it's such a joy to gather with you. You know, as we gathered last week, we talked about this prophet of God named Elijah. And Elijah found himself at the end of his rope. He needed to be provided for, and God provided. There's so much more to Elijah, and I'm so grateful that this week we get to investigate his life even further. And so as we worship today, we'll be in 1 Kings chapter 19. If you'd like to get your Bibles and find your place, we're going to talk about Elijah and we're going to find some principles for living today on what we do when we just feel like we're so depressed, there's no hope. There's always hope in Christ and so as you gather with us and we gather with you, as we sing and as we pray together, I would just ask, would you please go out in our Connect card and just put your name down and put your prayer request and your needs. We'd love to hear from you. You can find that on our website. You can find it on Facebook. And we just would love to connect with you and engage with you. And so let's join together now as we continue with being essential for Jesus this week, we are going to understand that God provides and that God will give us peace in the most uncertain of places in our life. Let's worship together. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a
so many of the songs that we sing come straight for script, from Scripture. And uh, one of those is the next song that we're going to do. And this comes from Matthew 11, and it's verses 28 to 30. This might be familiar to you. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Last week, I shared the story of Elijah, when Elijah needed to be provided for, that God found an unlikely person to provide all that Elijah needed. It was a widow who had very little left for living. She was going to make a small loaf of perhaps bread, and she and her son were going to ready themselves to die. Today, you and I will not be faced with that decision. But we are faced with a challenge, aren't we? We may think that we have limited supply, we have limited provision, and yet God gives us the same challenge as he gave Elijah. And God asks, will you trust me? Will you open up your hands and will you share? Will you be generous with your time, your talents, your gifts, your offerings? Will you be generous with your love towards your neighbor? Will you love your neighbor as I have loved you and as you need to love yourself? And so today, we're so grateful for the opportunity to open up our hands and to share with those that do not have the reserves that we have. And friends, let me tell you, I'm walking alongside people who don't have the reserve. 
And this church, Aldersgate Church, is responding in just incredible generosity. And that's because you take your offerings seriously. You are making a difference. You are giving people hope. You are opening up your hands to be generous, that someone doesn't need to worry about what tomorrow will bring. They're able to trust, surely God has my tomorrow. So thank you for your giving. There's many ways in which you can plug in and partner here at Aldersgate. They're on the screen before you. I would ask that you just search your heart and let God speak to you about what way this week God is asking you to open up your hand to love, to serve, and to care. Will you pray with me? Good and gracious God, thank you so much that you greet us exactly where we are, that we don't have to clean up our act. We don't have to be somebody that we aren't. We don't have to feel something. You allow us to come to you just as we are. Our souls are naked before you. And you look at us and you do not see the flesh, nor do you see the sinfulness. You don't see the selfishness. You see your image in us. How glorious that thought is to us. And so, God, we thank you. We thank you for your love and your mercy and your kindness and your tenderness. And we ask, oh God, on behalf of ourselves and then on behalf of all those that we know and those that we don't know for the hurting in our community. We ask for your peace. For the troubled, we ask for hope. For those that are angry, we ask for reconciliation. We ask that we might be bridge builders, way makers, hope takers into a world that desperately needs your hope. We thank you for the opportunity this week that we have to be generous with our time, our talents, our gifts, our resources, and our hearts. We ask as intercessors, Lord, thank you that we can bring others to your mercy seat. And so we pray for our workers. We pray for our school administrators, our teachers, our preschool and daycare. God, we pray that we might find a way to continue to be your church, that we might find a way to continue to love so that this world might be drawn closer, not torn apart. And oh God, we give you permission today to work against our will, to work against our nature of our flesh and to pursue us as a lover pursues his beloved, that we might know your love and then, Lord, that it would just, oh, it would just be such a beautiful thing for us to have the opportunity to love others. God, we thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for, for forgiveness. Thank you for eternal life. And thank you that we can trust in a God who will never leave us and never forsake us. In the mighty name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we thank you and love you, Lord. Amen. Today's scripture comes from 1 Kings chapter 19, 1 through 9. Ahab, who was the king at the time, told Jezebel, the queen, all that Elijah had done, how he had killed all of Baal's prophets with the sword. Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah with this message. May the gods do whatever they want to with me by this time tomorrow if I haven't made your life like the life of one of them. Elijah was terrified. He got up and he ran for his life. He arrived at Beersheba in Judah and left his assistant there. He himself went further on into the desert a day's journey. He finally sat down under a solitary broom bush. He longed for his own death. It's more than enough, Lord. Take my life because I'm no better than my ancestors. He lay down and slept 
under the solitary broom bush. Then suddenly a messenger tapped him and said to him, get up, eat something. Elijah opened his eyes and saw flatbread baking on glowing coals and a jar of water right by his head. He ate and drank, and then he went back to sleep. The Lord's messenger returned a second time and tapped him. Get up, the messenger said. Eat something, because you have a difficult road ahead of you. Elijah got up, ate and drank, and went refreshed by that food for 40 days and nights until he arrived at Horeb, God's mountain. This is the word of God for we, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, when I gather with folks, whether it be staff or friends or family, many times I find that our conversation goes like this. So how was your week? What were your highs? What happened that was great this week? And what were your lows? What are some of the things that you struggled with this week? Because all of us, when we're with friends and family, we want to know, right? We want to care about one another. And so sometimes the conversations of highs and lows, it's appropriate, especially now. Well, today we see the prophet Elijah. And we see him today at perhaps the lowest of lows, See, he enjoyed the highest of highs, didn't he? In the last chapter, in chapter 18 of 1 Kings, we witnessed the power of God on a personal level and a national level. I think 450 Baal worshipers, prophets of Baal, were just completely denied the power of their false god. God showed up in a mighty way. I would imagine Elijah was exhilarated as he poured water not once, not twice, but three times on that offering just to be able to show my God is a God of power and might. And when God showed up, the people responded and said, this is a man of God and this God of Elijah's truly must be the one true God what a high that would be. It would be as though we would actually have our whole neighborhood, our whole community say, we believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in God. And we'd be absolutely thrilled for that kind of mighty power of God being demonstrated. But today, we're going to see a different picture. We're going to see a different picture of Elijah, one of a man who has pushed himself beyond his physical and emotional limits. You see, Elijah finds himself in a period of depression. In this chapter that I've just read, we're allowed to see Elijah, a side of Elijah that both shocks us and I hope also helps us. You know, it shocks us when we realize that great men and women go through periods of deep, dark depression we want to think that those that we love and we respect and that there are leaders, that they lead with confidence, that they don't despair, that they're, they're not depressed. Well, Winston Churchill said this, depression followed me around like a black dog all of my life. And another, a young lawyer in the 1800s, suffered such a deep depression that his friends did everything they could to keep all razors and knives away from him. He wrote these words, I am now the most miserable man living. Whether I shall be better, I can't tell. I awfully forebode, I shall not. This late lawyer became the 16th president of the United States. His name, Abraham Lincoln. Even a man by the name of Charles Spurgeon, who is a great orator and preacher of God's word, was given to periods of depression History tells us that there were times when Spurgeon would be so depressed that he would refuse to leave his home to even go to church. And on more than one occasion, his deacons had to come and physically carry their pastor to the pulpit. Now, these accounts may shock us, but I think they can also serve to help us. How? I'm glad you asked. I think they can remind us that depression is a pretty common experience. It's something that happens in our lives. In other words, 
if you go through a time of depression, you're not alone. Notice some of these facts concerning depression. Because friends, depression affects everyone. I don't think that we get through life without experience depression one level or another. One out of every five Americans can expect to deal with depression in their lifetime. Statistics teach us that one person out of seven will need some form of professional help in dealing with depression in their lifetime. And untreated depression is the number one cause of suicide. But can I tell you, not all depression is bad. I mean, depression is a natural body, it's a natural reaction that we get when we're in shock, in times of grief, stress, frustration, or illness. When those times come, the brain releases chemicals, and that serves to numb our mind and our body. Under stress, our bodies also release a chemical called adrenaline. It gives a sudden burst of energy. However, when adrenaline is constantly being pumped into your system, it can have negative long-term effects on the body that leads to depression. So with these thoughts in mind, that depression can be bad and depression can sometimes help us to take time out and to look perhaps differently at life, to then kind of regroup and to see life on a different perspective. Let's look at Elijah's life and where he is in 1 Kings 19 and think about what happens to us when depression comes and how can we handle this issue of depression? So let's go to the backstory. After the great events on Mount Carmel, Ahab returns home, the king returns home to his wife Jezebel. And she's no doubt waiting to hear the news that her prophets wrote, wrought a great victory. After all, she probably saw the fire from heaven and now she sees the rain. So she must believe that Baal's responsible for all these things. But instead, she finds out that it's Elijah who won the day and that he's even slain her priest. So when she hears this, she is infuriated. She takes matters into her own hands and she decides Elijah must die. So she sends him a warning. She's going to have him put to death. Now, Elijah, remember, this is the same guy that we were talking about last week. He gave the widow the means to be fed for months. He trusted God. He had the faith. He prays over then her dead son a little bit later, and he raises his son to dead, to, from the dead because he trusts God and he believes. His faith, oh, his faith is huge. And then he goes up against 450 prophets of Baal, and he witnesses God's amazing power. He demonstrates his own faith in having his people soak that off three times with precious water. Remember, they were in the midst of a drought, so it hadn't rained for a long time. This was risky faith business for Elijah. And after all that, instead of standing like he had done before Ahab and the prophets of Baal, do you know what Elijah does? Well, we just read it. Elijah tucks tail and he runs away. It seems like Jezebel should have been a nothing, non-problem, don't you think? I mean, wouldn't you be tempted to tell Elijah, hey, Elijah, stand firm. When a person kicks at your life and your work, just ignore them and carry on. Except, friends, if we said that, we'd have to live it out, right? And how many times have you and I seen the hand of God in our lives on one day, one occasion, or even one season, and then circumstances change and we too turn tail and we run away. We say things like, I've had enough. This isn't fair. And we run. We just turn our backs as fast as we can and we run away. And Elijah, boy, he ran. He went 125 miles south as far as he could so he might avoid the reach of one woman. So he gets there. He leaves his servant, Beersheba, and then he goes another day into the journey, into the wilderness. So he's, now he's all alone. He doesn't even have a servant with him. He sits down under that broom tree, which is the only tree that would have cast any kind of shade. He throws in the towel, and he asks God, just take my life, take my life. I pray that you never get there, but I know enough about life and about situations that I know that I'm speaking to one of you today who have said, I've been there. Elijah has right, reached rock bottom. 
How do I know that? Well, let me tell you. He cuts himself off from those closest to him. He leaves his servant. And so as a result, he felt all alone. He physically and emotionally and spiritually felt so alone. Now, God still had 7,000 who had not bowed down to Baal in Israel. But Elijah never sought them out. You and I can become so discouraged that we can have a tendency to develop a I'm all alone. Nobody understands mentality. You and I can begin to think that, well, the world is just, it's me against the world. And that's a sad and lonely place to be, isn't it? I think that's where the fellowship of the church is so important. In times of discouragement and uncertainty, the fellowship of the church really should be that sense. We should be the broom tree for people to rest underneath the shade of our love and our protection. But it's sad for me to say this. The church can also be the place that doesn't take the time to allow the doubts and the sadness of hearts to have a place and a voice to lament to doubt, to cry out, to be depressed, to want to give up. Friends, you and I don't have to understand what someone else is going through, but we do have to come alongside each other. We need to pray for one another, and we need to be a friend. Elijah walked away from a friend. Secondly, if you read this scripture closely, Elijah took his eyes off the Lord and focused instead on his own circumstances. I mean, what does he say? God, just take my life. He's longing for his own day, death. Take my life from no better than my ancestors. You see, when I leave God and his power out of the picture, when you leave God and God's power out of the picture, we're going to be in trouble. Elijah said, in effect, I, I've had it. I quit. And he sat down and he gave up because he felt like his life was no longer worth living. Elijah stopped interceding for others. I think perhaps he had forgotten that he was a prophet to Israel and his attention circled around himself. I do that. I can get my thinking and I can cycle into the trash heap. I can start thinking negative thoughts, and before long, I just feel like I might as well just quit. Ministry isn't worth this. My life isn't worth this. And you do the same. The writer of Hebrews tells us, 12, 1 and 2, we have all these great people around us as examples. Their lives tell us what faith means. We need to look to those people. And the writer of Hebrews continues, so we too should run the race that is before us and never quit. We should remove from our lives anything that would slow us down and the sin that so often makes us fall. It's not to say that depression is not going to come to us. This is to remind us that we should never stop looking to Jesus for our comfort. So here's the good news. When you get discouraged, when you get depressed, when I get discouraged, when I get depressed, when we run away from the challenges that face us in life, God will be waiting. What I learned from this scripture that is just so incredibly beautiful and I treasure it so much is that God is going to be waiting when we exhaust ourselves. And when we finally stop running, I know that God is ready with a surprise that we don't expect. So what are those surprises that God has for you today? First, God knew that Elijah was physically and emotionally exhausted. Think of the activity on Carmel and his flight into the wilderness. This man is totally exhausted. This man is drained from the ministry that he's been performing. He's been giving out constantly. His emotionally, his emotionally mindset is just completely drained the Lord knows this about Elisha, and he doesn't rebuke Elijah for sleeping. Instead, actually, God refreshes the prophet, and he allows him, he encourages them to sleep and rest, not once, but twice. That should speak to us. Our bodies were not designed to be pushed constantly. I am someone with a lot of energy, 
But if I'm not going to be responsible to the gift that God has given me with energy, if I am just going to work myself, if I'm going to push myself constantly, then I am not set up for all that God has for me. I am set up to fail, to be depressed, and to be demoralized. You see, the Lord set this thing up so that each one of us could have a day of rest. Even Jesus tells us in Mark 2, 27, Jesus took time away from his work to rest his body. So that's why I want to say to you, I know it's hard for you to get away on a vacation, but even if you can have a staycation, your body needs the rest more now than any other time. It needs a break from activity. Some of you are working so hard at home at your jobs, and it seems like you're working around the clock. Please stop and rest. Breathe. Breathe. Eat. Take nourishment. Take naps and rest. You know, there's an old Greek saying that goes, you'll break the bow if you always keep it bent. I used to do archery as a kid, and I used to, when I was done, I'd have to take that string, and I'd have to take it off the bow, and I think, well, it could just be ready for the next time. And then my instructor said, no, actually, the string will either break or it will stretch, and there'll be no good times for you. Well, there's times when you and I I think we have to unstring ourselves. We need to relax. If we don't, we'll break after a while. God never designed us to be under constant pressure. So how are you today? Maybe you can relate to some of what Elijah was feeling. I felt the constant pressure of life and ministry. And what I've learned is I need to seek the refuge of the Lord. I need to find my own broom tree for me, right now, it's a season of a kayak. If I can get by with one hour on a beautiful lake, on a quiet, quiet evening, I'm strengthened. What is your broom tree? Because I believe that God wants to strengthen your burdened life and give you renewed strength for this journey. I've also suffered, remember I said, from bad thinking. I've seen things from my own perspective rather than taking the time to be refreshed in the Lord and see the perspective of God on my life. There's much more to Elijah's story and more in his future, but let me leave you with the following assurances. This is what I've gleaned from just letting God speak to my life through Elijah's life. The first one is Elijah had not been forsaken by the Lord, and neither are you, friend. You might think that you have more questions than answers. You might think that you have more bad thinking than good thinking. You might think that you're up against a brick wall in trying to find a solution. But God is not going to forsake you. That's a promise. I say that more times than not to people. God will never leave or forsake you. If you find yourself in a dark night in your soul, if you find yourself in the deep strays of sin, God will not forsake you. That's the first thing. Know that in your life, God will never leave you. The next that I want you to ponder and claim for your own is that God had a plan for Elijah's future ministry and for his life. And God has a plan for your life. In fact, can I tell you that the deepest lows of my life when I felt that I couldn't see any hope, there are the times that God has used me to touch other people. It's not when I've been on the mountaintop and I'm able to say to someone, I figured that out and it's all good and I can, I can direct you, I can be a wise counsel. No, most of the times when God is using me is out of that emptiness. It's out of that widow's emptiness. It's out of a hard, tough time. And then God brings someone else who's struggling, and I'm able to say, I too know what you're going through, and this is what I've learned, because I'm able to look hindsight and see God redeemed it. God didn't plan it. He didn't orchestrate it, but God does not waste anything that happens in our life. If you feel like you're at the end of your rope, like I said last week, if you feel like the depression has just overcome you, then know that God has a plan for your healing, your future, and your hope. And lastly, 
God wants to bring you out of this place. God, after feeding Elijah the second time, said, go now, go now, eat. You're going to need strength for the journey. And he takes Elijah to Mount Horeb, where he's going to be listening. God, I need to hear from you. God, speak to me. God, what's the word? Let me know your presence. And God then comes again in the most unlikely of voices, not in the wind, not in the fire, but in a tiny whisper. Friends, God wants to do the same for you and for me. Don't think that you're above having episodes of discouragement and depression. It can happen to you. It can happen to anyone. We typically probably won't get through this life without going through a season of hopelessness and discouragement. If you've recognized a tendency in your own life to be depressed and discouraged, then let me invite you to bring your need to the Lord Jesus and to find a trusted friend to travel this journey with you. Remember what Jesus says. This is a verse I love to memorize. Come to me, all you who are heavy laden and burdened. Come to me, all you who labor and I, I alone will give you rest. I will never leave or forsake you. Cast your burdens upon me for I care for you. So I want to leave you with a thought. It's just on my heart today. And that's this. Your depression, your experience of hopelessness is not a sin. See, depression is not always as a result of sin. But you just don't need to travel this path alone. Seek the help of trusted friends. Seek out a wise counselor. And can I say there's some people who don't believe that Christians can become depressed? Like they just have this stereotype that, well, if you're a follower of Jesus, then just snap out of it. Where's your faith? Just get over it. If you trusted God like you should, you wouldn't feel like you do. It's not of God. God never promised us that he was going to save us from discouragement and depression. God promised us, us to be with us, to sustain us, and to be with us in every instance that we find ourselves. I have a colleague who I recently found out took a medical leave. And he took that leave for depression. He wonders when he'll ever be able to come back in ministry. But this person, this colleague of mine, blesses my life because he goes on Facebook and he shares his story of depression. He writes about his depression. He's raw, he's authentic, he's real. And do you know what he's teaching me? He's allowing me to be the same. He's refreshing and sustaining my spirit because what he's declared is he trusts in a God who's already meeting him at the broom tree. And you and I, friends, we can trust in God. He runs faster than we do. And when we get to the end of everything that we know, when we get so discouraged because of what life is handing us, when we get so lost in our own thinking and our spiral thinking, our negative thinking, God's already to our resting place. When we get to the end of everything we know and we just fall down and we're like, I, I just can't, I can't do this. I can't do this. God is there. And God yearns to give you rest. God yearns to provide for you, both the physical things that you need, the emotional things that you need, and the spiritual very presence of God to help you not only to survive, but to thrive. I thank God today for Elijah. I thank God that Elijah was vulnerable enough to be truthful with you and I centuries later that we know, God, when I get to my broom tree, when I'm just trying to find the little bit of shade that I can possibly find, thank you, God, that you're already there. In the name of Jesus, God is already there. Amen and amen. You are my joy. You are my song. You are the well, the one I'm drawing from. You are my refuge, my whole life long. Where else would
Yo. Your- 